My name is Nicole Wakabayashi. Miguel Campino. Mi Zhang Li. Enriqueta Samarriba. Daniel Cunhas. Lisa Yui. Matthew Cunha. Miao Yue Huang. Stephen Hoven Li. Andrew Sell. Anna Vitis Schrede. Martin Mills. Mark the Hero Woman. Pedro Emanuel Pereira. Quentin Oliveira. Abraham Fanus. Stephanie Ping Chong. Paul Oliveira. Trisha Don Williams. Michelle Powell. And this. Porto. 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 Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Porto Piano Fest. Thank you for joining us. I would like to thank Oscar Colomini Bosch for being here. It's a pleasure to introduce him. Um, he's a long-standing member of our artist faculty, and it's it really is a privilege to have him at Porto Piano Fest. As an introduction, um, Dr. Oscar Colomini Bosch is currently the Dean of Music at the Escuela Superior de Música Eina Sofia in Madrid, Spain. He's the former director of music of the Yehudi Menuhin School in the UK as well as the, a former professor of orchestration at the Royal Academy of Music. Oscar is also a composer and a conductor with a distinguished career. He's guest lectured at the Royal Conservatory of The Hague in Holland, the School for Young Talent, and is part of the teaching faculty at the Acousticum Talent Program in Holland and our own Porto Piano Fest. His studies were completed at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama and the Royal Academy of Music in London with Malcolm Singer, Simon Bainbridge in composition, and Alan Hazeldine in conducting. As a composer, his recent commission from the Yehudi Menuhin's International Violin Competition, Spiegel for Solo Violin, was described by American composer John Adams as a small masterpiece of both musical and dramatic imagination. Impressed by the piece, John Adams programmed Spiegel in the Los Angeles Philharmonic Green Umbrella series, inviting Oscar to attend the American premiere in the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. We will have to, the opportunity to listen to that piece a little later and to discuss. As a conductor, Oscar was also invited to conduct great orchestras such as the Orquesta de Valencia and was recently invited to conduct the youth orchestras of the Bogota Philharmonic Orchestra in Colombia, amongst many others, in international festival and major concert halls. So without further ado, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you, Oscar Colomini Bosch. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Nuno, and a pleasure to be part of the Porto Piano Fest family and to share what we do and uh, how we uh, do music and how we teach uh, with, with all our viewers and also you know our own experiences and so on so it's a great pleasure to be here thank you of course um, so let's talk let's start by talking a little bit about briefly about your beginnings your beginnings in music how did you start writing was that your first passion how how did everything start well um, actually I, I, I started not not writing um, music as such. I actually started writing words. I, I wasn't quite sure I was going to pursue music uh, as a career and um, so I, I decided quite late that, that that's what I was going to, to do, um, probably when I was about 18. Um, and really uh, I think the passion for writing words um, and that was something that then led to actually the, my interest in composition. But at, the, at that time, I was mainly a violin player. I was, I was very much uh, in, into being a performer, and I, and I pursued that. I was in the Spanish National Youth Orchestra, uh, and, and so on. And through that, uh, I discovered many more aspects about music and music making and, and performing, and and how pieces are put together. You know, the experience of being inside an orchestra. Uh, as a living organism and, 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 and living through a piece of music like a Mala symphony from inside is, is it was a, an incredible experience um, and it really sort of fed my interest and my imagination as to you know there's a lot more in music to be learned and a lot more to be to, to, to be explored so um, it was after that that actually I decided to come to London um, to study 
music there to pursue further studies. So, so I did there uh, another uh, degree in composition. Uh, once I had finished my violin degree in Valencia, I moved on and I, and I studied composition at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama with Malcolm Singer. And uh, I did there a, a B master bachelor course and a master. And eventually I moved on to the Royal Academy where I did a PhD with uh, Simon Bainbridge. But it wasn't really a, um, a, a, very, a very straight uh, forward path. You know, I, I still kept playing until I was around 24. Um, and it was, it was then that really I, 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 I thought, well, conducting and, and composing really uh, are my, my main interests and when I decide what I wanted to do, really. Excellent. So that, that transition from, from performing, from, from writing, uh, not music, from, from writing words, and then the violin became, became your focus through composition in once that led you to London. Um, what other ideas inspired you in, in your studies and in your, in your early career? Well, I mean, I, I mean, as a composer, I, I wasn't interested mainly in, in in narrative, the idea of narrative, how does musical narrative work, um, as opposed to, to literary narrative, how does one create uh, things like uh, multilinear narratives that are easier to a certain extent to create in literature, that they are in music, um, the idea of self-reference and, and deja vu, you know, sort of all the all these sort of Proustian ideas. You know, how how does one generate those moments in music? Um, so I was not really interested um, in, in in sort of compositional techniques. I wasn't I wasn't a very geeky composer in terms of you know finding little processes that you know I would I was going to go and then use to generate pitches or rhythms or whatever it was. Um, I was really interested in 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 in, in ideas of narrative, ideas of memory as well. Um, I was very interested. Um, I, I stumbled um, uh, across a, a book in the Guildhall Library um, written by Derek Cook, uh, who was a composer and musicologist, and he, he completed the, the manuscripts of uh, Mala 10, and the completed version exists, but now there exists, you know, a few actually, I think. But um, one of the first uh, completions of Mala 10 was done by Derek Cook, and he had a literal gem of a book which was pretty much slated by, by musicologists, um, uh, particularly new musicology, because he, his idea, he talked about musical archetypes. He took gestures and then observed uh, how those gestures had evolved through time and had been dressed differently, but actually they remain the DNA, the musical DNA in terms of maybe pitches, contours, uh, rhythms, uh, and other characteristics remain constant. And that was something so bring, that, bringing those memories, those memories of, of those gestures, of, of those exactly how, into that, the forefront. That's it, and how a, a new composer, you know, is, is in a way using um, those gestures from, you know, former times and then transforming them and, and bringing them out to, to the public again under new clothes, but basically it's the same gesture. So all of this sort of was those ideas were, were the, the, the main sort of passions that sort of fed where I was going to go in terms of composition and my interests, uh, uh, you know, in terms of composers and so on, like Ligeti and Didier, uh, and then also outside of music interests, like um, Jung, for instance. So all of those things suddenly became uh, very, very, um, very important um, avenues for me to explore and to, to, to then sort of put together um, uh, as a composer and, and explore my music. And how did the memory of performing, how did the memory of, of playing an instrument, how did that influence um, your, your own writing? Um, your recent piece, your recent uh, success is uh, the piece Spiegel that you wrote uh, in 2016. Um, and that's a piece for solo violin, right? Which, which is pretty much based off, on your own experience as a violinist, if I'm... Yes, right. that, that that that's true. I mean, it, it was it was a very it, it was a, it was a weird uh, situation in that uh, I was commissioned. I was very lucky to be commissioned by the Houdini International Violin Competition, 
um, and the Britain Peers Foundation to write this piece for, for, for the finals in London in 2016. And, um, and in a way, it was the anniversary of the, of the competition. Um, um, it, was, it was, in fact, Yehudi centenary uh, that was being celebrated. So the competition wanted to bring back to the center of, 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 of that, um, of that uh, competition year the, the figure of, of Yehudi and, and, and his, his life. So um, it was interesting for me because uh, he, he wrote his autobiography is actually um, titled Unfinished Journey. Uh, he very much believed that you know life is a, a, a journey of search and transformation, which is not a novel idea. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it's sort of, I wanted to reflect through the piece on Yehudi's idea of what life is. But also at the same time, I find I found myself as, as uh, just to respond to your question, I found myself also drawing from my own experience of what violin playing means. And particularly solo violin, you know, when one is sort of alone with the instrument without any other, any other accompanying uh, music uh, surrounding him. Um, so it was very interesting for me because then I used in that piece many things that, that, were, that were dear to me. And part of the idea that we've been talking about before, you know, things like um, the idea of instruments having, you know, having a memory of mm -hmm. themselves. So certain gestures you replicate, you know, going back to the Derek Cook little book called uh, um, The Language of Music, you know, there's this certain gestures that trigger memories of pieces that are from the past. And you can, you know, the instruments, I believe, have got that sort of, that sense of uh, cultural memory within them. You know, there are certain things that immediately will, will trigger in one um, emotional responses and, and, and memories of, of other, other music. So that was something very, very uh, important for me to actually bring, and my own experience, but to also to bring to that, um, to that piece and to the narrative of the piece. The other thing that also interested me was to, 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 to make very obvious to the audience um, the idea of physical motion through the performing space, uh, space as a sort of, you know, as a relation between the, the, the journey in the external space and then the internal journey of that, that the music and the performer is going through. And, and is that, the, is that journey? Is that journey at all? Is that journey at all um, influenced by by Menemin's words or Menemin's ideas? That well, idea? I mean, the, 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 the idea of, of that, in a way, is that um, you know there were certain pieces that 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 that, that they really was very um, you know very attached to and that had been very important to him. So I I thought that I should take you know for instance you know. Um, the, the, the Elgar concerto, which he recorded with Elgar in, 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 in London. Um, that was a very, very, very important moment in his life. Um, so I took the, the, the four note motif of, of the opening, or for instance, you know, another very powerful figure in his life was Bartok. So I also took some ideas from the, uh, from the fugue of, you know, uh, of the Sonata for Solo Violin, or for instance, Enescu, who was his great teacher, uh, you know, his third violin sonata, you know, also stole uh, small gestures from there that then are sort of, you know, interspersed in the, in, in, in the piece. And even, you know, uh, Chrysler's cadenza to the Beethoven violin concerto, which he play, uh, played with Fudbengler in, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in Germany when he was a boy. Um, so, you know, all of those things are sort of put into the piece. Um, and, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of the journey being something that almost forces you to look at yourself and your own change made me think of the idea of the journey as a mirror and spiegel is the yiddish uh, for mirror so in a way the piece is a mirror that that actually shows who you are and and and, and what you've become through the journey uh, and makes you realize who, you know what your real nature is by actually going going about, you know, like, like, like Robert Louis Stevenson, there's a wonderful little quote that, that, that says that, you know, it's not really where, where one is going, you know, it's the, the, the real affair of the thing is to actually to move. 
and, mm -hmm. and I think that is through motion that 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 you know that's like a mirror that actually shows you who you really are. So all those things are sort of put together uh, in, in in the piece, and I wrote it with with great deal of love because of, of what you know the figure of obviously of, of Menuhin meant to me. And at that time, I'd been you know working at his his school for ten years, and um, but also as, as 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 you sort of implied before, you know there was a great deal of of myself as a violinist that 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 sort of was and my memory of what it physically to, to to play the instrument to actually and go through the you know the, those pieces of the repertoire so there was a so many so many ideas sort of so many ideas so many layers and uh, so much to absorb i would suggest I'm, I'm going to suggest that we listen to the piece so that we can we can actually see it in uh, in action so oscar call me Spiegel for solo violin.
we just listened to Ye Song Sophie Lee at the finals of the International Menuhin Violin Competition uh, in London at the Royal Academy. Um, what an amazing performance, wasn't it? Yes, uh, she also won the, the, the prize for, for the best performance that night of my, of my piece, uh, which was a very hard, a very hard thing to judge, but, but, uh, but, but uh, all in all, I think that night she really, she really did, did an incredible job. It's a, it's a beautiful performance. Very Amazing. Powerful. So could you tell us a bit more, now that we know the piece better, a bit more about this, this recording, any, any particular features you would like to, to highlight from this, from this piece? Well, I mean, uh, first, first of all, I think that, you know, for me, that, that event was, what was, um, was a great, luxury uh, to actually be able to hear five completely different performances in a single night of your piece that had never been premiered before. So, mm -hmm. and, and also, particularly, um, it was great luxury because in a way, uh, we've been talking about all of those ideas that have been putting into the piece. And I think that you can now really see the piece sort of unfold in the space. And, and, and uh, something that we hadn't really mentioned before is that um, another, another of Yehudi's ideas about music and life was that, you know, one should not really trust too much the things that are absolutely ready-made and finished with a little rhythm, that one should always try and sort of find new things and explore and improvise to a certain extent. And so the, 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 the piece was written in a way that there was quite a lot of freedom that the, the, the players could take to organize material, to, 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 to choose what material would go at what, at what uh, point of the piece. Um, and there was main markets were, remained constant for everybody, of course, but you know, they had quite a big uh, sort of choice in terms of how to shape the big narrative of the piece and the journey, you know, the dramatic start of the, of the, of, you know, of the journey of, of, of the life you know, from afar. And then how the, the, the violinist and, and, and the music sort of comes to the center. And, and you know, obviously when, when, when the violinist comes onto the stage and sort of turns towards the audience, that's the, the, the climax of the piece, obviously. But then in a way the piece sort of also um, sort of continues uh, almost as if it transfigures and, 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 and the player continues the journey, but we are not going to hear what, what happens next. The piece has sort of happened before us and, 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 and it's gone out of our, of our perception. And talking about an unfinished idea and a continuous perception, was your own idea of your, of your piece uh, changed in any way from listening to five different people playing them, playing that piece? Was, was, were, was your vision transformed as well? Well, uh, what, what I, I think it was not transformed. It's, it's probably one of the pieces that I, after listening to it in five performances, I was really, really thrilled that I, I had actually achieved what I wanted to achieve with the piece. Um, and uh, my main objective really, I mean, obviously, you know, all of the stuff we've been talking about are ideas that are crucial to the piece. But in a way, my, 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 my first idea was create a piece that is designed to highlight um, the parts of or, and the aspects of the personality of the players that normal, you know, repertoire and normal, uh, you know, a final of a comp international competition would not highlight. So in a way, the piece is also designed to force those young musicians to actually show who they really were at that point in time as musicians and as human beings. Um, and I think that, you know, it, I really, really think that the piece does that. I think that, that it's a piece that forces you to actually make that journey yours and, and to show who you really are through the drama, through the stage uh, move, you know, the use of the space, the use of, uh, of you know, pseudo improvisation in the way the structure's put together, uh, timings, uh, silences, uh, pace of movement. There's so many va variables that one can actually use. Uh, that is almost impossible to actually do a performance of this piece and not really show who you really are. That is, that is fascinating. And this piece called the attention from the great composer, John Adams. 
um, who invited you uh, to go to the LA Field and uh, the Walt Disney Hall. How did that happen? How how was that? That was that was a, a great uh, a great fluke. <laughs> that was that was that was in in, in the best possible way. Um, because one of those uh, amazing coincidences that happen in life, and, um, and, and you know, history is, is full of those, so it's not that something that doesn't really happen, but rather the opposite. Uh, I think that it happens a lot more often than people want to admit. Um, but in this case, it was really, really a question of um, luck that um, there was this, this, this wonderful uh, violin studio in Seattle um, and, um, called the Coleman Studio. And Simon James is one of the main teachers there, and Simon is the concertmeister in the Seattle Symphony. So Simon was, was, was preparing two or three of his students to actually come to London to, to, to be in the finals of the Houdini Mending competition. So what happened to them was that, you know, they received this very strange piece that was made of all these little fragments with quite a long sort of text and, and instructions as to how to go about, about performing it. And I, and I think that, you know, they were probably quite, um, Quite confused by the whole thing, so um, I think he used the the, the chance that, that that came upon them when uh, John Adams was conducting um, the uh, a tour with Leila Josefovic of his own uh, violin concerto Shirzad too, and um, so they were rehearsing with us with, with the Seattle Symphony, and Simon went up to John Adams and said, "Look, John, you know we 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 are preparing these young musicians to go to this international competition. This is a new piece." Uh, would you, you know, be so kind as to listen to them and see how they do and whether you have got any advice and so on. And John was a lovely man and I came to know him late, later and very, very kind, very generous. Um, he said, of course, I'll listen to them. So Simon brought his students to the symphony hall and they played there while people were putting chairs away uh, from the rehearsal. They played a piece for, for, for John Adams. and. Uh, the thing is that, you know, there was this young, wonderful, wonderful violinist called Marley Erickson, unbelievably talented um, and in incredibly expressive, a beautiful playing. And, and John Adams just fell in love with her playing and with a piece. And there and then he just said, I'm programming this great festival in LA, in the Walt Disney Hall. Uh, it's Going to be called Noon to Midnight uh, as part of the Green Umbrella series in October. I want you there. I want you to play that piece in the main in, in, in the main hall. Um, and that's how it happened. And I and I found out Simon got in touch with me and, and he said, you know, um, I think you're going to be pretty happy, but I think your piece is going to be played in the Walt Disney Hall because John Adams is 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 you know is invited uh, Marley. So um, then subsequently, the, 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 the Los Angeles Philharmonic invited me over uh, to, to be there for the American premiere, which was a, a great success. And it was really, really a, a beautiful experience and, and, and being there. And, and of course, you know, then meeting John, who was very, very nice and kind. And it was a lovely, lovely, lovely experience. That is such a fascinating story. It's, it's really <laughs> how, how things happen in life. Uh, the most unexpected circumstances lead you to, to, to great things sometimes. And also, I managed to eat fantastic sushi. It was <laughs> the most amazing sushi. <laughs> that, is, that is a plus. That is a big plus. Um, so we, we were talking about composition, your composition, but there's another, another side of you, another very active side of you, which is uh, conducting, performing, but it must be con through conducting. Um, how did that, how did conducting begin for you? Well, um, actually, I, 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 the reason why I wanted to go to London, as I said before, was because I, I was really very interested and very passionate about, um, about you know, um, everything to do with, 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 with music. You know, I, I, my experience in, in, in the um, Spanish group is not really transformed the way I saw music. So, uh, I suddenly wanted to know and do everything. So when I was in London um, uh, studying as a composer, I also had this great interest in conducting. And, and I started you know, uh, going to lessons, uh, uh, a second study uh, with, with Alan Hazelman, who was an absolutely 
brilliant teacher, uh, a very, very uh, dry, uh, quick witted Scot, and, um, and very acid sense of humor. He was absolutely wonderful and very, very funny, great sense of humor. And, and I learned everything that I know about what good you know, conducting technique is through him. Um, and, you know, pearls of wisdom, little nuggets of information and, and little sayings that, that are still with me every day and that I, I still tell my students in lessons sometimes or I will repeat to myself in rehearsals. Um, so, um, but I think that my approach at that time um, also came from my understanding of what was mainly colored by what my understanding of what orchestral musicians, I think to a certain extent probably it still is today, uh, what orchestral musicians need and what orchestral musicians want uh, from a conductor. Um, and I think that that probably at the time made me at the same time a bit more difficult as a student because I had been sat, you know, I was 20, my, you know, 24, 25, 26. Um, and I had been sat in orchestras for quite a long time, working professionally and with pretty decent conductors, you know, like Andras Ligeti and, and, and Yulini and, 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 and Lutz Gola. So I, I sort of knew what, what, what a good, you know, and yeah, Andrea Maceda, I knew what a good... You had, uh, you had all the experience so from, had, exactly, yeah. from, from being in front of playing for great conducting conductors and then you yourself being being the conductor. Yeah, so I think that that made me both a better student, but at the same time also probably quite a, a, a lot more difficult student to have too. And it's always those 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 contacts with 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 great teachers that influences and that take us in different directions. Um, but it must have been somewhat hard to combine that the performing, the the composing conducting, how, how did you bring all together? I think the great thing about, uh, for me of those years, what I really remember uh, with, with great, uh, great affection was that the, the Guildhall um, was actually a very relaxed, um, unorthodox place. Uh, so you could, if you were uh, clever enough, uh, you could almost do what you wanted with the program. And, 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 and actually almost sort of tailor-made, uh, you know, your, your, to, to your interests. And I managed to, to, to do that. Um, in a way, at the same time, I was beginning to realize that, 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 that my real passion and, 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 and what I could do, and I really enjoyed doing, in a way more, even more than performing, was to compose and to conduct. Because in a way, I was starting to see conducting like almost an extension of my violin performance at, at that point. Not, you know, it's a different instrument, but it was the same thing. Um, and, and in a way, the, the, the experience of, of the constant study, not just of, of compositional techniques, but also of repertoire, 20th century repertoire, different analytical tools and so on. I mean, all of that really, um, what, the, what that did for me, that unlocked and refined, you know, every, all those things that I learned in my second degree sort of became the, the keys that unlocked the, my, what I learned in my first degree as a violinist, as it were. So all those things that were there ready to be used suddenly became illuminated with a different light and suddenly they all made, made sense. Um, the key, and the key to, to unlock the other, the next doors. Yes, but in a way, there were, there were doors that I already had, but I had never access to. So it, it's almost like having a, having a house and then finding out that, you know, there's a lovely living room that you never actually bothered to open the room to. And you always were perfectly able to, you know, you had the house all along, but it's just that you, you never had the, 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 you know, the insight to actually sort of uh, to do it. You know, things that are up to that point, are, people used to sort of credit me with like very good intuition, or, you know, or you have got good taste, uh, things like that, that I just thought were good intuition or good taste, you know, those things. You know, at that point, suddenly everything became, you know, in focus, you know, came into focus. And I could see that, you know, there were reasons why I was in, a, in an unconscious and natural way 
aiming towards certain things and not others. You know. So yes, yeah. I had very good I had very good intuition, but there was a very good reason why that intuition was good and not bad. If that exactly the, the, ch the challenge with good intuition and good and even good taste, but mostly intuition, is is to make it intentional and not a, pro a byproduct of of um, of no chance. chance. It, exactly, it, it bringing it consistently to the to the forefront. Absolutely. So I mean, in a way, for me, what what, what, what happened at that point really is that for all of those things just just bubbling away like like you know like boiling, you know, boiling water. What happened is that in a way everything made sense and, and came together. So. I, I, I started to see musical gesture and imagine musical gesture um, and color and pace um, to a completely different level of uh, subtlety um, and, and, and depth. And it was very, very interesting because it was both detail but also long, long range vision. It was also uh, you know, small, uh, but also the narrow. You know, this the, the the actual small sort of like a matter of bar or two bars gesture, and then also the narrative of the piece. So, in, and also the colors. It, everything suddenly became a lot more rich and a lot more well defined. Um, and it was really um, a, a great moment. And I don't think I, I think I'm more conscious now, ironically, of what was actually happening. Of what process I was going through than I was at the time. If you probably had asked me at the time, uh, and we were together in the guild for around the same years, so we coincided more than twice having a coffee in the lakeside, uh, you would probably have asked me these questions. I would probably have had yeah. no idea what was going on. It was, um, it was just happening. It was probably not the moment to, to analyze it, but just, just to let it happen. <laughs> Uh, also, coffee was was very good, so that that would be a uh, not a, the, different, a different conversation. A different conversation there, talking about this this conducting the conducting and the, the subtlety and and the great gestures. Uh, <clears throat> there's a piece that comes to mind, which is your recording of uh, uh, von von Willem's piece. Um, tell us a little bit a little bit more about about that yes, piece. Well, I chose I've chosen that piece just to show a little a little bit of it. Um, just the beginning, the first few minutes, um, because at the same time that all of those ideas about musical gesture were beginning to sort of gel together and, 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 and almost sort of become incredibly sort of detailed and, and rich, um, I was incredibly lucky that at that time, um, we all were happy, I think at the Guildhall, Hall, um, that, that Colin Davis was actually quite involved with coming once or twice every year, doing a little project with the orchestra, coming to do a read through every, every so often. And, and I still to this day think that Colin had in his sort of later years, maybe not when he was, uh, he was in his thirties and forties, but later on he developed the most stunning, fluid and expressive baton technique that I, seen in anybody. And it, was, I used it, was to, very, it, it was indeed a, um, a, an event when whenever he came to, to the Guild Hall and it was always an experience to see him conduct so close and uh, or coach uh, some some quartets I remember seeing him. Yes uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was there. Okay. Okay. And it was always uh, a, a big experience uh, something that made an impression to see him conduct and his the drop and his gestures is the intensity absolutely absolutely no it was it was really inspirational um and also fascinating i remember i, I used to miss huge number of lessons and, and just go and, and sit and and, 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 and watch him conduct i was terribly shy um, and i think i spoke to him about a couple of times but i would just spend hours watching his, his technique and, and linking at that time, linking the musical gesture was happening in the music, and and, and seeing how subtle his choice of movement was, yeah. you know, as to how to draw something, and, and 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 I remember that you know everybody in the orchestra used to say that you know, and in the public, uh, for that matter, that you know, the moment Colin turned up, the whole orchestra sounded completely different, 
and the string section, and it was so noticeable. I mean, the string section sounded about three times louder. Not louder as in sort of volume, but sort of in depth, in dense density of, of harmonics, in quality of sound. Uh, it was just, it turned from a sort of like a, a breath of, of sort of weak air to like a torrent of water. So it, it, was, it, it was absolutely wonderful. And, and it was that sort of thing that really, coupled with all the technical stuff that I had learned from Alan Hazeldine, watching Colin conduct, and together with all those ideas about gesture that I was developing, I began to develop my own, my own language of, of, yeah. of, of how to use my body to communicate those gestures to the orchestra. And this piece, um, the, the Talis Fantasia by, by Vaughan Williams, it's iconic in that it's, it's one of the iconic pieces for, for in the string repertoire. But in this case, I would just like to share with everybody those first minutes to see the great joy of, 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 of a string section, you know, when the, when, when the baton technique and the gesture of the, the language, the corporate, you know, the physical, you know, body language of the, uh, of, of the conductor really accompanies what the um, physical action of the result of the is. therefore communicating, you know, unconsciously a, a huge amount of information that normally would take hours to, you know, to get across in words. But if you sort of can use your body in that way, it becomes a lot, a lot easier, a lot more intuitive, and the result live is, 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 is rather impressive and all the credit to the, to the youngsters in the orchestra, we can talk about that. From the, the Yehuli Menuhin School Orchestra, uh, very high level youth orchestra, mm -hmm. ages 15 to 19, around that. That's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, Where you were... the, the school is 8 to 19, but the orchestra uh, ranges from 14, 15 up to 19. Where you were the music director and uh, worked with them intensely on this, on this project. And the result was this amazing um, recording, which we'll listen. So Oscar Tomina Bosch, Bosch conducts the Yehudi Menuhin Orchestra on Von Williams. Thank you. 
Wow, what a great experience to listen to that and to actually be able to see the gesture, the music, and see young people playing at such high level. It's very, very impressive. I mean, it is. It's a wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful orchestra to play um, to play uh, with. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say to conduct, but to play with um, as a conductor. Um, I mean, it, it's with all the orchestras that I might have worked with, and um, I've worked with with, with 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 a few. I think that you know, it was such a you know in in, in such a different um, experience to be able to work for such a long time on on specific pieces of the repertoire. You could really share every detail with the players. You could really get them to buy. The, the, the idea, make it theirs, and then bring it to performance like that, which is absolutely phenomenal, um, and still be free in performance. Um, so um, for me, it's been one of the most satisfying uh, experiences um, as a conductor, I think, to work with the Houdimani School Orchestra, uh, no doubt, absolutely no doubt. I mean, generally, I think that youth orchestras tend to respond um, then to respond more to to the sort of personality that I am, which is you know uh, I really work on the small detail. I think probably professional orchestras uh, are it's almost like um, being being tasked with painting uh, the Sixteen Chapel. You know you have got the Sixteen Chapel, which is this amazing building and this incredible space, but that's what it is, and you've got to basically with quite big brushes uh, sort of managed to, to paint a great scene in that space. Um, and I think I'm not quite a big brush sort of conductor. I'm, 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 I, I, I care about the detail and the small scale things a lot more. And you can really get, um, get that level of, of, of definition and nitty gritty with, uh, with, with, with youth orchestras because they really are incredibly enthusiastic. You're talking about younger people, um, a little less experienced, with, but giving them the opportunity to have a, a high level uh, performance, a high level, high level experience. Um, and that's also part of your work as an educator, uh, both at the, the Menuhin School and now at the Reina Sofia in Madrid. Um, tell us a little bit more uh, about your, your educational work, what, what you do. Well, um, I was, again, while all these things were happening and I was trying to do a bit of everything in my life, th this, this also came along the opportunity to work um, at the Hulu Management School in 2006. Um, so um, there I, I had as, as, a, as a mentor, uh, uh, Malcolm Singh, who was then the director of music. Um, and uh, you know, obviously I had studied with him, so I knew him very well. And he had himself studied with Boulanger and, 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 and Ligeti. Um, so in a way, was that lineage of teaching. You know, Hans Keller had been at the school, and that was a great influence that was still very much alive. It is still very much alive in the in the way things are taught at the Menuhin School. Um, and I had great great colleagues there. Um, and but I think in a way, all of that set me up again, to use the tools that I already had in a new way. But what really made the experience unbelievably fun and fruitful and, um, and a great learning curve uh, and, and a fantastic uh, opportunity to learn were the students, because the students themselves were incredibly talented. I mean, goodness gracious, I mean, a lot more talented than I am. And, 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 and it was really lovely to, 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 to work with them and through teaching them, also learn from them. Um, and through working with them, also discover new things that, that, that could enrich what you were doing. Um, and that for me really, I mean, it might seem a very silly thing, but teaching or, you know, oral training, which probably most people now are shuddering at the other end of their screens, um, for me, it became a real fun thing to do. And also because it, it made my perception of time um, and, and um, at the micro level, unbelievably acute. 
And through that, again, I managed to unlock what I understood as organic or, or, or natural expressive timings. Suddenly, I found a completely conscious way of articulating uh, that sort of expressive timing in a way that was organic and could be free, but was constructed in a way that, that could also uh, be, be... With be, structure be, and with... Be, exact, absolutely, be reproduced and understood and communicated and, 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 and used. So, I mean, it was a great experience um, as a pedagogue, but also, you know, a, a transformational experience as a musician. Um, and, and in a way now, you were asking about the, the Reina Sofia, I mean, I'm in a different moment of my life, now um, and I think that um, it's a great opportunity. I mean, it's been a very weird term. I've been there since since April, but I think I've been in the building uh, about three times because of, of COVID nineteen, obviously. Um, so it's been a very strange term, but it's a great institution. It has got a great heritage, and the team there is absolutely fantastic. And um, both, you know, the 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 the, uh, the leadership team but also the teaching staff, the professors, um, uh, the administration staff, um, the support staff. I mean, I've been really very impressed by, 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 by the high quality and dedication of all that team. And in a way, now I'm just waiting to be, you know, to, to, to get involved with the students once we open the, the doors in September and, and, and begin to work with them uh, and find opportunities to, 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 to keep sharing things that might be useful for them, but also for me to keep learning, which is, which is also... I, I think uh, we're all looking forward to, uh, to that moment where we can go back to, to that kind of normal life contact, having students, having the teachers, having our day-to-day. -day. Um, but um, you mentioned uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Singer, Nadia Boulanger, Ligeti. Um, how did they form your your personal identity or personal philosophy on on teaching and on thinking about music but mostly on teaching and that you pass to your students i mean the the, the main thing about the the boulanger um method in a way um there were there are many aspects to it but but mainly uh, and most importantly it's a socratic process so that is, you don't give the students ready-made solutions. You don't tell them that's how you do it. You teach the students to ask themselves the right questions and then let them find the answer. So that's, that's obviously, you know, if you're under great time pressure to produce results, that's not really the way that's going to happen uh, because this sort of method really and this philosophy of teaching tend to produce results in the long term. Um, but it, it, I, I really believe in, 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 in its profound transformational effect. I mean, through all of that, I also became very interested in, 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 in Jung, in Carl Gustav Jung, and his sort of theory of sort of depth psychology. And, and in a way, you know, learning music it, it is like depth psychology in that, you know, as I was, as I was saying earlier um, uh, th this evening, it's 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 about making stuff conscious. You you sort of do things, but actually, it's when you own them properly and consciously that then you can actually use them freely because you can make choices on them. And I think exactly. Otherwise, otherwise you're based on on that instinct on the good year, but that produces the inconsistent results. It's it's a fruit of the inspiration of the moment, and it can happen or not. And it's it's. I, 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 Absolutely, yeah, yeah. and also, and, and it's funny because these things are sort of they they they, they are pumped up, as it were, you know, um, and 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 it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you know, um, you know, or mistaking inspiration uh, and sort of instinct uh, and sort of putting all your bets on that um, because actually, you know, that that might be completely placed in the wrong place in the long run, and and I think that sometimes there is a there is a danger that certain type of students m might sort of think that you know everything they can rely forever in their instincts, 
um, mm -hmm. and that will make up for everything else. And that that that's really not 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 it will not take them certainly much further down the line than they, they are at that point. Um, so you know the way I, I, I look at, at music and and, and and the teaching, you know, in a way is finding what sort of um, archetypal gesture are we talking about? Going back to our friend Derek Cook, which has come up a few times tonight, you know, um, that 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 idea that you know what is this gesture like? Uh, what does it remind us of? What is it sort of that is telling us? It comes from very very deep. Uh, you know, beneath the surface, you know, not just reminding us, you know, oh yes, there's a gesture, you know, this is Wagner, but there's a gesture in Beethoven, but it's a bit like that, and Beethoven picked that gesture, and it's a bit like that in Mozart, you know. I'm thinking now sort of going all the way right back before there were even words. You know, what is that gesture? What, what, that came before even words existed? You know, and that, that is sort of almost put you know, um, it's a bit like being an Indiana Jones, you know, finding meaning, you know, what is happening, you know, look at those scattered dots of ink, you know, on, on the score, you know, that is not just bits of information. It's not just ones and zeros or pitches or rhythms. It's a code that's telling you, and it's talking to you about something that is a lot older and a lot more basic and a lot more organic. And that's sort of in a sort of mother base, sort of, you know, um, uh, plaque, you know, it's, it's part of the motherboard of, of, our, of our of our system, and in a way, you know, when working with young musicians, um, that's that that is the business. The business is not to teach. The business is to actually making um, helping them make those connections between the actual dots scattered on a piece of paper and who they are. And if you can do that, then Things become quite, quite, uh, quite straightforward. Intense. <laughs> quite intense, I would say. You coach quite a lot in both in solo instruments and, and chamber music groups. Is that is this something that you apply on your on your coaching when you're working directly with students? Is this something that you deliberately look for? Yes, absolutely. I mean, for me, um, in a way, it is almost like a staple thing of the way I approach coaching. Um, which I think is a great way of doing things, but I think you know, but it can a lot a lot of time you know it is, is it can be misconstrued by by being totally tedious, you know, um, because one of the things I, I I I like to do is to actually to 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 develop in the performer or performers if it's a, an ensemble to develop a great deal of um, a, a, a refinement of what this the, the gesture is trying to do. What the piece, what the relationship between the various bits of phrasing might be, the various bits of harmony. What is what's happening in there? And um, and of course, you know, uh, most of the material in music is presented in, in the first sort of thirty-two bars or so, um, or at least you know what might make for at least two thirds of a piece is normally present in the first sort of Beginnings. you know uh, forty bars or so. Um, so I tend to, even as a conductor, which is something that you know. Um, is very frowned upon. I tend to spend a lot of time working and sharing insights and defining, you know, very slowly sculpting and making the players aware of what is embedded in those little bricks that make the big building that is the piece. But I like to look at those early bricks and sort of see how they should be shaped because then that illuminates how everything else goes really in the piece. So, you know, uh, this is really very unpopular with players, you know, but, and I spend probably way too much time working on the first few bars and, 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 and boring the musicians to death. Um, and I, I quote a uh, good old uh, Barbie Ori, there's this wonderful clip of him working on, I think it's a Bruckner scherzo, I can't remember the, the number of the symphony, but he's working on a Bruckner scherzo, uh, the, the yam baram -bam. And, 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 and he's sort of insisting and insisting and insisting. And there's this wonderful little phrase that he says that, you know, if we get this right, we get the lot right. And I think that that might seem like something very stupid to say, uh, but actually it's very profound because, you know, what uh, he's course, saying is- If you get the little excerpt- Exactly, if you understand, understand the base. Yeah, yeah, if you understand that little nugget, then everything else is derived from it. So, um, so that's something that for me is very, 
the idea. Um, and for me, just musical gesture, I, mean, I think gesture is a profound word because we should always be understood well beyond music, you know, almost like invisible movement, because that's what music to a certain extent is. Um, so, you know, if one defines a gesture well, um, and almost finds a parallel organic physical gesture that goes with it, that already gives you color, the raptor amplitude and speed, articulation, uh, whether it should be sustained or there should be a, a diminuendo or a sense of decay, or the weight or the impression of weight should be, the density of the sound, the lightness or airiness of the sound, everything else is just, you know, um, a question of them taking those gestures. An expansion, and then, an expansion of that element. Exactly, then exactly. organizing them in the hierarchy and, and so on, contrast, contrasting, developing this, that, and the other. But it all comes from from that from that sort of uh, that, that sense. So in a way, you know, I, I I think that as you can see, I I couldn't really coach just talking about that's how you shift and 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 use this bow type of bow here. Um, for me, everything is a unit. You know, I look at the score like a composer, like an analyst, like a conductor, like a performer, and then, you know, try to make that organic and, and try to help this, the, 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 the musicians find that connection, you know, and that, and the that, and that help is, is with sort of extreme persons. Uh, for instance, at Porto Piano Fest, where we have a world-class, um, Aris faculty with, with great pianists and great teachers, great pedagogues, pianists, all of them, um, working with students to help them play, perform the piece, learn the piece, help them technically as well. Um, and then we have your your contribution, which for me it's it's crucial and it's something that we we do it with with a lot of joy, um, having having your vision on. On this, uh, imparting your vision on these on these students, um, can you describe us a little that's bit? That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it really is our pleasure. Um, what exactly do you do at, at Porto Piano Fest, and how can a composer, a conductor, um, help pianists? Not not at the piano. I am focusing on the actual music, uh, on the score, on what it means, or what it should sound like, on how it's put together. So in a way, I'm not focusing on technique. I'm not focusing on, on, on one could say, the great uh, difficulties that everybody faces as an instrumentalist to actually not just hear something, but to then be able to do it. Um, and a lot of what happens in, 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 in instrumental pedagogy has to do with the how to do it. <laughs> in effect, that's the, you know, that is a huge part um, and I think that, you know, probably for the students it, 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 at Porto Piano Fest and other places where I, where I coach, is that, you know, it's quite liberating, I think, and inspirational can be, it, to actually, for a, for a bit, actually not be focusing on the physical way of achieving a sound result, but just work on the ideas of what is that you're actually trying do. what is that gesture that you're trying to portray you know um, because I, I, I think that in a way once they stop being so concerned about fingers and wrists and shoulders, and shoulders they, actually, they, they actually listen they listen more and they listen better and, and what can happen is that through finding an organic understanding of the musical gesture and not being terribly concerned at that moment with the fingers, the wrists and the shoulders, they might actually find a way of doing them as well. So Fair it might actually unlock some of, the, some of the physical difficulties and some of the physical problems, because in a way, for a moment, you are not focused on them, but you have sort of gone to the opposite side, you know, to the hidden side of the moon. And you're working on the stuff that you're normally not focused 100%. Um, and and somewhat, some, sometimes when you are not looking at something, it comes right, and and, and that can be, I think, also a, a, a fun thing to 
to, to, to discover that, you know, I might be sort of using an image or a way of, you know, not being a pianist myself and not knowing actually anything about piano. And then suddenly someone will say to me, that makes it so much easier. And I'm just thinking, I, you know, I, 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 I couldn't know. Because by, I couldn't by making, know. By, by becoming more intentional about your musical intentional intentions, um, you, you, your technique adapts if you have a, a clear mental image of what you want to do. But sometimes I think what also happens is that because we are so consciously trying to do what we've been told we have to do, sometimes there is a blockage in the movement. And I think that if one is focused purely in the sound that imagines and purely in the, in the experience of the sound that's coming out of the keyboard, sometimes that blockage can, can be dissolved. And I think that that's, that's one of the, one of the uh, precious things that you know, can happen in one of the sessions. Um, but obviously most of the work is to do with really helping them understand how the music is put together, helping them decode those dots on the page into gestures that are actually a lot of the time a lot more simple than they look on paper. Exactly. And that's, and that's one of the, the highlights of, of the festival for, for me as, as, as a director of well, it's, my it's my privilege. It's, my it's, privilege. it's yeah. to, have, to have those um, different, to, to enable those kinds of different experiences to, to our young pianists. Young pianists, very advanced, most of them um, very talented, very advanced, who come there for, um, for advice by, by our great artist faculty. And this moment where it, it, it always confuses them a little bit the, if, if they haven't worked, if they haven't been there before, and they don't know exactly what's, what's expecting them, um, they're always going in a little suspicious, uh, what's exactly going to happen? And then I sometimes see them come out and uh, there they have a big smile on their faces and, and say, okay, I, I understand now. <laughs> well, um, that makes me very happy. Thank you so much for for being here. We have we have one more one more surprise we would like to to present one more jewel we'd like to present from you. Um, we have a a great recording of Schoenberg, uh, the Weltlacht Um It's it's a, it's really a, a special piece. Would you like to just give us one? Well, uh, I I thought it it would make after. Uh, you know, after having discussed so many things about music and music making, I, I think it's a piece that is so rich and so complex. Um, and and um, again, it, it, the recording, um, you know, the performance is with the Hoodie School Orchestra um, just about a year ago, um, a year and a week, I think, or something like that, or a year, a couple of weeks. Um, and. Um, and I think it sort of combines everything that we've mentioned today, the clarity of the gestures, the sense of color, the sense of uh, balance, the intricacy of the textures, how to resolve those and make it sound natural. Um, one, of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest challenges of that piece, if anybody has bothered to look at the score and not just listen to the recordings, um, is that Schoenberg's original metronome markings don't make much sense. Sometimes they do, sometimes they really, if one followed them absolutely to the letter, the piece would fall apart and the textures would not be understood. It would be quite chaotic in, in places and rather unsuccessful, I think. Um, so in a way, it, it really is a piece that with its long narrative, single movement, 35, movement, uh, 35 minute uh, piece, um, it really uh, is, a, is it was a great mountain to climb in terms of performance, um, and I think it's a great sort of example to share uh, with, with 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 the audience tonight um, to show that actually all of these ideas uh, that they do not produce uh, this sort of fear that sometimes young students, young musicians have that you know if you overthink things too much, they, they will become stale and they will not be expressive. And yes. one of the great, great joys of working with that orchestra uh, for such a long time, having so much time to prepare is that 
we could be unbelievably precise, but also unbelievably free in the moment. And you can feel that freedom and that sense of, you know, um, the excitement of of the the, the 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 unknown, the not being quite sure when something is going to happen. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's a wonderful, wonderful performance. I'm definitely one of my 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 favorite uh, recordings of mine uh, of all time. So um, I hope that that the audience tonight will will enjoy it uh, as much as I enjoyed it conducting it that 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 night about a year a, a year ago. And uh, they can maybe see some of the things we talked about tonight reflected in the way the music is shaped and and, and, and played. And thank you very much for, for having me. It's been an absolute, absolute Oscar, pleasure. Oscar Kalamina, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. Thank you for, for sharing your insights, your thoughts and, and your music. Um, thank you to our, our viewers for, for being with us. I hope, I hope you enjoyed. And I can think of no better way to finish this, um, this interview, this chat with Oscar than, uh, other than uh, watching uh, and listening to some great music. So Oscar Kalamini Bosch conducts the Yehudi Menuhin School Orchestra conducting Schoenberg's Werklachtenacht.
Thank you. 